Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor and privilege to stand here. I'm sorry that we can't provide translation for you tonight. <laughs> and you have to put up with my cute accent. <laughs> but uh, bear with me. Uh, the greatest compliment I have ever received was when someone came up to me and asked me if I'm from Mississippi. <laughs> who has a very significant connection to Kansas City and is world famous. Do you know who that is? Okay, if I say the name Al Krabowski. Yes. The Mad Hungarian. Oh, okay, the Mad Hungarian yes. played two years for the Royals. Oh. Well, I'm, I'm teaching you something about the yeah. York City and the Royals. I know nothing about the baseball, but I know about the Okay. Uh, I'm sure you would be better off him playing than me speaking, but uh, there's another uh, Hungarian who became known in the U.S. Uh, by, by her madness and by her anger. That was Zsa Gabor. Okay, she slapped the policeman. Okay, she was an, another mad Hungarian. Okay, consumed nine husbands. Okay, and uh, I was not named after her. <laughs> we the same name, but, but no, she, we're not proud of this. So, by no means, my desire with this talk is to further advance the reputation of that Hungarians are mad. <laughs> and, uh, so, what I'm going to say, it's not out of madness or anger, but uh, what, uh, it's a great honor. I also feel disqualified to address this group because I don't know much about you and I don't know much about this culture because exactly four months ago today we moved to the US so we don't know much about your culture, your history, your sports and, and a lot of other things and uh, we came with fear and trembling <laughs> not mainly because of what it means for us personally to leave the culture that we lived in for 50 years and what it means for our family, but because of the role that God called us to play in the U.S. as a new mission field. Part of the reason God sent us to send us here is to be a warning sign, a warning sign to you, alarming and warning you guys that the direction your country and many of your churches are taking is the wrong way. In order to be able to unfold some of my concerns to you, I need to bring you to the angle from where I see America from and the Church of America. The place and history we grew up in defines us. I'm a European, more specifically an Eastern European. I was shaped by the, the specific history of that place. Arthur Kustler, uh, another famous Hungarian, uh, who is a Nobel, Nobel Prize winner author and wrote the phenomenal book titled Darkness at Noon, described the end product, what our history has shaped us into this way. To be a Hungarian is a, colla is a collective neurosis. Well, 15 minutes from now, you might agree with him. <laughs> well, my, my history had been deeply impacted by two totalitarian regimes, fascism and communism, which destroyed everything around us and burned our families to ashes. While history, my history makes me an outsider of yours, a distant stranger who knows not much about your history and your politics, and your sports, and your mindset. At the same time, the same history it qualifies me to be a warning sign to you. I'm watching you, America, for a long time. Not as a distant stranger, but as a grateful and loving friend. I am in debt to you. When I grew up in communism, you have sent missionaries to me who have poured their lives into us, 
shared the gospel with us, prayed for us, taught us from the scripture, and trained us to be leaders. God used America to help me find meaning and purpose in life, taught me life skills, pointed me the truth, provided a structure that helped our efforts to reach our own nations, and gave me lifelong true friendships. Most of what I know, most of, most of what I became, happened through the American church, and for that, I'm eternally grateful. I always looked up with gratitude and respect to America. For someone who almost lived half of his life under communism, America represented hope, freedom, and fresh air. I always honored Americans for their creativity, for the love of freedom, for their courage, uh, for their willingness to take risks, and for their boldness and faith. But the America that I love and admire so much has dramatically changed. And I, I came here as your younger, weaker little brother telling you that what you are becoming scares me. Your racism scares me. What you allow your children to be exposed to scares me. Your media scare me. Your politicians scare me. Your nationalism scares me. Some of your influential church leaders' words scare me. I'm scared to see how morality evaporates and immorality fills the space. I'm mostly scared because it seems that you don't see where this leads to. Let me paint your future, America, if you do not repent. I am your future. My country is your future. My continent is your future. My past is your future. We turned our back to God in Europe. And this led to self-destruction and many wars. The continent that gave the world Bach, Beethoven, Haydn, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, Goethe, Thomas Mann, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, and I could go on and on and on. That continent in a very short 80 years mass murdered 130 million of its own citizens, not counting portions. And contagiously infected the whole world with philosophies and ideologies like fascism, communism, and liberalism, which led to other millions of deaths around the world. Europe thought that uh, we were superior to other nations and other parts of the world. We thought we had the right to colonize them. We thought we had what we are doing, uh, we're, we're doing something great to export our knowledge and our education and our culture to other parts of the world. But as a famous Hungarian poet wrote once, a nation which pursued to be superior over other nations will either become a hangman or a funny man. We never thought that the power of ideas can lead to the power of weapons. We never thought that, word, that words can be so powerful that it can wipe out families, generations, and whole nations. We never imagined that ideologies, a distorted view of man, a denial of God, and a public questioning of our own values could lead to the deaths of hundreds of millions by the past. Turning our back to God will never remain a private act. 155 million Americans turning their back to God will have a significant ripple effect worldwide. You cannot be different. And you cannot be inactive. And you cannot say, oh, I'm so sorry. That's not enough. You have to do something about that. Let me point you to a very alarming passage. Matthew 11, 20 and on, Jesus denounced the cities where most of his mind works had been done because they did not repent. This is what he said. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. 
but say that. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will, will you be exalted to heaven? You will be brought down to Hades, for if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have repented, if it had remained until this day. There is not another nation and another language than America and the UK and the English language where God has raised up so many godly prophets and teachers and leaders, from Jonathan Edwards to Spurgeon, from Moody to Whitfield, from William Carey to Billy Graham, from Bill Wright to John Stubb, from Hudson Taylor to John Piper, and I can go on and on and on. English is the language in which 90% of the Christian materials have been born and printed. America is the land where the str strongest seminaries and best seminaries can be found. It's unprecedented in the human history how God blessed this part of the world with Christian resources. And with all that, 2.5 million people leave the church every year, and North America is the only place where the church is not growing. God did not give all those gifts to you because you were better, smarter, greater, or more talented, or more humble than other nations. You did not deserve it. God never owed you anything, not even the gospel. He gave it to you out of love and out of his sovereign choice. Jesus says in this passage that he knows what would have happened if he would have given these blessings to other nations. If Sodom would have seen this kind of miracles and these teachings and blessings, they would have repented. If China, if Russia, if Iran, if Iraq, if Saudi Arabia, if Libya, if Syria would have received what you have received, they would have repented long ago. To whom much is given, much was given, much will be required. Let me close with a story. Three days from now, we're celebrating and remembering a very important event in history. In Hungary, on October 23rd, 1956, a handful of Hungarian students and faculty workers started a revolution against communism. It was brutally destroyed by a Soviet army while the rest of the world passively watched it happen. They were fighting for freedom because Freedom is essential. It's a reflection of who God is. He is free. He gave us freedom so we would be able to create, flourish, and live out all the attributes, what it means to be created a human, a human for, for the image of God. Rising up against slavery is one of the most God-honoring acts you can do. We were created to be free, and we were delivered by the gospel to be free. So choosing slavery and choosing to become a slave, when you could choose to be free, is nothing but denying everything you were created for. And nothing but denying the gospel and trampling on the gospel. And tonight, I'm here to warn you that you are losing, you are losing your freedom. You lost it to a greater de degree than you, you realize. Matter of fact, you've voluntarily given up most of it. You're choosing to become slaves. Slaves of being entertained. Slaves of sporting events. Slaves of consumerism. Slaves of your own children. Slaves of your own culture. Slaves of your own nation, slaves of your own kingdom. When you choose your entertainment, your children, 
and your nation over God and His kingdom, you choose to become a slave. When you choose your fear of losing things over the fear of God, you decide to be a slave. You might say, well, the task is daunting. It's so huge that we can't even wrap our, our arms around that. It's much bigger. These are giants, and giants are everywhere around us. And you're right, these problems are giants. But remember the story when, when uh, the spies were sent in Numbers 13 and 14, they were sent to spy the, the land. And uh, they came back and said, this is impossible because we are grasshoppers. These are, these are giants and we are grasshoppers. But then we read another story of a teenager who said that, oh, there's a giant and, well, the birds are going to have a good feast tonight. <laughs> You're going to, you have to make a decision. Are you going to be a grasshopper or a giant killer? It's your decision. But one day, Jesus is going to have a little private conversation with you. And he's going to show you a film. A film of your life as a giant killer. What you're going to see is the life that you live right now. You don't have to have fancy, big, effective weapons to take down giants. You need to have a big God and a small stone. And tonight, you can help us to throw a stone and take down some giants. Thank you. God bless you.